Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet Earth, which uh, is still sadly wrapped in a pandemic. Uh, you know, here in the rich world, we kind of think uh, to some extent it's over, although I've got one son and one good friend who just got tested positive yesterday. Uh, several billion people on the planet are not even vaccinated at all, let alone multiple shots. We're on an overheating planet. We're on a planet now riven uh, by um, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And it, all kinds of reverberations come from that. And we're on a living planet. It's an amazing place full of life still, despite all that humans have done in our brief span of uh, running around and through our development. Uh, although some of those species are imperiled. Um, I've been writing about some of them, the ivory billed ivory woodpecker. I'm writing a piece, a fresh update on the vaquita, the little, tiny porpoise down to the last seven or 10 animals left alive. And we're going to talk about fish, some of the biggest fish ever. Well, not, I wouldn't say ever, but the biggest fish uh, living on this planet includes some real oddities. And this is not just about the oddities. It's about what they represent in terms of uh, biodiversity more generally and the environments they live in. I'm really pleased to reconnect with Sudeep Chandra from the University of Nevada, Reno, and his colleague, Zeb Hogan, I think is going to come on if we can work it out. You're just back from Cambodia, I believe. Yeah, we just got back from Cambodia uh, maybe seven, seven days ago or so, uh, working in the lower Mekong River uh, with a team of people to try to to try to explore some deep pools that are within the Mekong River from water quality all the way to the native protected, uh, need to be protected biodiversity. And this project, I think, is called The Wonders of Mekong? Yeah, so this uh, project that we were at the, the mission that we had to try to explore these deep pools is supported from a USAID funded project called, cooperative project called Wonders of the Mekong. And the Wonders of the Mekong project in its broadest sense is trying to uh, facilitate capacity development to explore and understand the lower Mekong River and the influences of big natural pertur uh, perturbations like shifting climate, uh, but also uh, enhanced perturbations to the natural environment uh, from dam development to um, uh, 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 land use change and how it might affect the Mekong River's water quality and biodiversity. And then another bigger aspect of the capacity development there is we have a, a whole group of 25 plus people working on Mekong issues that are our Cambodian colleagues. So we're developing education programs with the universities there and with the government of Cambodia. Huh. There's a uh, comment that just came in that's worth addressing right away. Uh, Elliot Tynus Fairley says, I watched, I, I believe a PBS story yesterday that said the Mekong would be in great shape if other Delta dwellers and especially dams would ease up. So I guess this is this, you know, we have super superimposed interests when it comes to water, right? Um, here, right in here in the Hudson Valley, I'm surrounded by the history of water. Right down the street from me is the Foundry Brook that where they created the cannons that helped to win the Civil War. And now it's an open stream again. And, you know, everywhere on the planet, we have these clashing interests around water. H how is that playing out there? There are like 70 million people in that watershed, right? Yeah, so the thing is, is the Mekong, the lower Mekong River is the lifeblood of Southeast Asia. I mean, there's 60 plus million people who utilize the natural resource as part of their livelihoods, whether it's uh, utilizing the fishery for fish protein, bathing, uh, water sources, things like that. So it's clearly a region of the world that's intimately connected to nature. But what's happening, especially in the last 20 years or so with the rapid development of the region and lots of foreign investment, uh, what we end up seeing is um, large amounts of dam development, dam development that supposedly is good for energy development. But then you also, with the energy development, dam development, have rapid deforestation and you have rapid urbanization of areas. And those all put a lot of natural pressures on the resources. Yeah, this is tough. I'll show us a, a couple of your slides in a minute that you can get at that. But let's let's start with the news, which was about this uh, extraordinary uh, giant stingray. Um, I could play the uh, clip. It's very quick, if that's okay. You, maybe you can talk over it. I do. Fantastic. Have to, uh, hold on a second. Or actually, set the scene. So, where are we on the Mekong? Yeah. So, so, so we're in the lower Mekong River of Southeast Asia, and this is in the Cambodian side of the river, towards the northern part of Cambodia. 
And our team of uh, researchers and educators from the Wonders of the Mekong Project, our, Mekong, uh, our Cambodian colleagues, drove seven hours overnight to get to this field site uh, when they heard of a catch of a giant stingray by the local community. So part of our project interfaces with the local community to um, then interact and, and work with the community once the fish is caught, then to release it back into the waters, tag it and release it, and then try to try to enhance and understand where these fishes are going to, into the system. The exciting part about this is it's a collaboration not only between the Wonders Project and our Cambodian colleagues, but also local community members. So they have a, a vested and an interest in, in um, protecting the biodiversity as well. And so it, it's this is one of the most exciting things because the stingray is um, large, it's highly endangered. Uh, it is uh, not a common species that you might see in the system. And so capturing the taxa, it's, as you can see in just a moment, will be quite, it's a huge fish. So, uh, and it's fresh right. water, so it's a pretty exciting feat. Yeah, I, I, I'll talk about some of the giants here in the Hudson River that I got to go out um, and study with and report on. Here we go. Yeah. So you were saying that there's a general understanding around there. If you get a giant fish of this sort, please contact the local biologists or? or... Well, not, so not, gener not, not necessarily a general understanding. What's happening in the community is it, uh, around those regions is these large fish, whether it's the giant uh, stingray or the giant catfish, or maybe even turtles, they are being captured and, and they're also marketable. So we have right. the fish may be moving cross borders into Vietnam, for example, for sale, uh, maybe moving into food markets. But what our project is trying to do is embed ourselves and work with the community to try to understand what the sensitive habitats are, but also establish more of a catch and release uh, system to try to understand the ecology of the fish. So I think your colleague who, who just chimed in a few moments ago talking about the dams, like these other large big perturbations affect the movement and migration of these large dams but what's hopeful to us is the idea that we caught one of these they're still in the system even after right. 20 years of big changes that are happening and i don't know if you see that in the hudson or not but some of those large migratory taxa are still around which gives you a little bit of hope for conserving oh the totally uh, it, um, i when i was working with national geographic society a few years ago a um I heard from a, a New York State biologist that they had they've been doing this annual uh, uh, sonar surveys for sturgeon. The Atlantic sturgeon, you know, used to get up to 21 feet long and half ton or more the females, and uh, they they saw a signal of a 14 footer, four, and that was like so much bigger than anything they had seen in recent years. It was really remarkable, and uh, it's it's just a testament to the recuperability of some of these fish species and ecosystems if we give them some space. Exactly, that's the exciting part. Hey, real quick, my colleague Zeb Hogan, who's the lead of our project, I think may be sitting in the back room or backstage. To be I think answer. he may have the other, he probably went to the other link because uh, he's not, I don't see him in the green room. So- Okay, no problem. Give him the I link. This. You got yeah, it. Yeah, he can come in. Uh -huh. I, I, I did email him, but it's possible that he has the other one. Um, well, the excite I'll say the exciting part about both the Hudson River stuff that you're describing in our work is the fact that these taxa and these species are still around notes that even with these big environmental perturbations, they're still persisting, which makes me want to figure out, and I think our colleague Zeb, what can we do to enhance or conserve their populations? It's not too late, in other words, to um, find solutions for protecting our biodiversity. Right. So hold on, I'm just going to find your slides, which I had here, and I've got to open up. And hopefully uh, we'll have Zeb on. Some people may be familiar with your names from the uh, TV work that uh, he did and, and you were you have been part of too. Exactly. So while you're pulling those up, our colleague Zeb Hogan is, is the host of the show on National Geographic called Monster Fish. And this National Geographic show, I, I really love what he does, which is he brings attention to the plight of the 10 largest freshwater fishes on the on the planet. But rather than just doing things like other shows do, going to catch the fish and, and maybe hunt the fish or something, it's more about understanding the system and the people around them and what we can do to protect, protect the species. Right. Uh, here he comes. Great. Good to see you. Hey, Zeb. Hey, how's it going? 
Good. Oh, yeah, I know you were in the wrong. My, you're, I have a capacious uh, uh, production studio with many rooms. <laughs> yeah, no, I, just was waiting, yeah. I was waiting backstage in, in a different room. Yeah, but here so we Zeb, are. We were just we were just chatting about your uh, efforts globally on the show Monster Fish to try to bring yeah. and highlight the 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 need towards conserving the ten largest freshwater species in the world and and how, what we're trying to do as part of the Wonders of the Mekong project, which I told them about. Right. Great. Yeah. So how, so Zeb, how did you get into this universe of big fish? I was doing my PhD in the, the Mekong River Basin, and I was studying migratory fish that were likely to be impacted by a series of proposed dams along the Mekong, and mm -hmm. uh, heard stories of really big fish, uh, including Mekong giant catfish and giant freshwater stingray, and gradually became more and more interested in the ecology and conservation of these big fish. No one was really studying them. They all seemed to be imperiled. They all, you know, uh, needed a little, felt like needed more attention. And so I gradually became more interested, applied for a, some funding from National Geographic in 2002. And that kind of started all of this work. That's pretty amazing. Uh, it's kind of a, remarkable to me that they weren't being studied. You know, these maybe they're just so big, they're sort of hiding in plain sight. Yeah, it's not that they're so big, they're hiding in plain sight. It's like, you know, this this giant freshwater stingray catch really illustrates the issue, which is th these fish are rare. They're found in remote areas. The stingray, uh, very big, very difficult to catch. They're yeah. hard to study. Uh, you know, it's just not a very easy animal to find. And if you can't find them, they're sure. very difficult to study. Yeah, and actually, we didn't talk yet about the uh, the expedition. The the you know the Hudson River, right where I am on the Hudson River, uh, right across from West Point Military Academy, has the deepest spots, about 180 feet. And but this is deeper, I believe. And you, you know, the Hudson here is more of a flooded. It's really more like a um, fjord than a river. It's there's the downward flow, but it's an arm of the sea too. So what what's the plan? Or what are you, you're using ROVs or um, well, yeah, I could start off. So Sudeep actually was doing transects of the Mekong. He uh, with a with a team of, of researchers, uh, some one from USGS. They developed a platform so they could do rapid water quality measurements all up and down the Mekong. So they did this countrywide transect. But as part of that transect, they could measure river depth. And so the deepest spot that they found on this transect was about 260 feet deep, 80 meters. And so that's the area on this latest expedition. That's the area that we focused on. It's just upstream of the town of Stung Trang on the Mekong in Cambodia. And this particular area has a fish reserve that the community has established to uh, protect fish. It happened to have the deepest area that Sudeep measured uh, on his transect. And we know these deep areas are very important ecologically. And so, so we decided right. to take an expedition to study this area in more detail. There we go. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a good example. Yeah, so that's a good example. What we did with our colleague, uh, Luke Logan from the US Geological Survey is, and our colleague, Aaron Koning, is we put together this platform, platform that Luke is leading called Flame. And it's, mm. it's basically this uh, high-tech devices on boats that you can run through rivers and lakes to look at uh, water quality, greenhouse gas emissions, and in this case, depth. And you'll notice here, we're in Cambodia. And if you guys of you who know about Cambodia, there's this great lake, tropical lake called the Tonle Sap Lake, which becomes a giant ocean during the wet season when the Mekong reverses its flow into the lake. But if you follow it down and then go to Phnom Penh and go upstream to that little town called Stone Trang in the upper right corner of the slide, uh, those are where the deep pools are kind of in that region of the Mekong River. And you'll notice that some of those pools are 40, 50, 60, or in this case, we found a pool that was 80 meters deep. So that's uh, 250 feet below, you know, the surface of the water. And, amazing. and what's neat about you, it's amazing. You're in a river and most of us think like, oh, rivers are just kind of long glides or maybe the Mississippi kind of moves uh, in, a, in a gradual fashion, but we don't think about the bottom of these systems. Right. And the bottom of these rivers, in, in this case, are like large deep lakes or ponds, deep ponds. And then they have these 
uh, textures to them, maybe inverted caves where they've got hidden structures within those deep ponds and 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 crevices and things like that. And, and these we think that these fish use these deep pools and then maybe use them not only for feeding habitats, but for um, kind of keeping with their resilient population. So yeah, great, exciting times. That's really incredible. Um, are they doing sonar too? Is that a sonar device? The um, Yeah, more or less like this code, flame code device. device. Exactly. Is is more or less, uh, it's fixed onto the boat and it's just basically, a, a, think about it as a glorified fish finder, right? That does uh, sure. integrate all the shape of the river. So um, technology today, I think that's part of the wonders of the Mekong project is to bring in capacity and new technologies to understand the, the large river. And I don't know what you're, um, who's out there uh, online, but you know, a lot of us study things by measuring fixed points in rivers. The biology right. is a fixed point or we go out every day to a certain point, but now we can look at things across space and time using these new technologies. That's so great. I'm showing an image here. This is from this sur this sonar survey. The Hudson was June of, um, I guess it was 2017. Uh, maybe it was 2019. And the fish in the middle there is estimated at 14 feet long. That's Atlantic sturgeon. Those are, those are skinny. Species. Those are skinny sturgeon. Look at those guys. They are, <laughs> you know, right? So the lunkers, the, the females, uh, historically. <laughs> Doesn't look like that, certainly not in breeding season. And it's just, again, to me, uh, and hopefully, again, along the, the Mekong, there's a sense of uh, wonder and pride uh, that comes as you see ecosystems restored. How, how, I know you. a lot of that USAID project seems to be built around building local capacity and integrating it into education. Can you talk about how that feeds back into the conservation? Yeah, we uh, have a support a big team over there, primarily through the Royal University of Agriculture, uh, Faculty of Fisheries, and we're supporting uh, five or six master students, five or six PhD students, and three postdocs. So a very large cohort of students who are studying fisheries, water quality, uh, mapping using satellite imagery, this uh, flame technology that Sadeep's talking about, and so. Uh, Master students have already received their degrees. Some of them went on to now start their PhD. And so the idea, we're fortunate enough with this project, it's an eight-year project. And so we've been fortunate enough to actually stay with this group of students for a long time. And the idea, I mean, this is probably the largest group of, of fisheries professionals anywhere in the Mekong uh, region. And so the idea, of course, is that they'll continue on with their interest and their research and their work and continue to learn about the Mekong and help safeguard and protect it. Hmm. So the threats include, they're not all like right on the river. Um, uh, uh, Sudeep, you sent me a slide of showing the deforestation pressure, which reminds me of my time in the Amazon rain, rainforest, the Amazon basin. So, yeah, how, so how does that relate to what's happening? Well, so when you think about this, I mean, part of our foray was talking about these deep pools and the beautiful stingray that's there. Sorry, I've got to fix the slide. It, I keep hitting the wrong button here. It just goes away. All right, there we go. Yeah, so, so part of what we're doing is is it's one thing to think about the Mekong River longitudinally, how the fish move through the river and things, but but there's these perturbations that are happening. And we talked about dam development to start with. And, and as we have more dams and energy, we block the migration and movements of fishes through the river. But we also change the flow of water and hydrology uh, and where it goes because the dams operate during dry seasons uh, and they're pushing water down that would not normally be down downriver, for example. But yeah. in this case, another another major perturbation is deforestation. And this is our colleague, uh, Safna Lahani, who published a paper in Water uh, in a special issue we had showing if you look at this over time, that there's a time series of forest and non-forest change. And you can yeah. basically see ra rapid, rapid deforestation, just like the Amazon, but in the lower Mekong Basin. And a lot of this mm -hmm. deforestation is occurring around the Great Lake that I just talked about, Tonle Sap Lake, and then around these critical habitats or where dams are being put in. So with dams, we get uh, people. With people, we get deforestation and illegal logging. And yeah. so this is, this is, you know, some people might say, well, who cares if we have these landscape changes? But just like in the Amazon, big changes in deforestation from deforestation leads to changes in water quality. It could lead to changes in precipitation and localized precipitation patterns. So right. these forests are absolutely critical to protecting a healthy ecosystem. And ours was one of the first projects to show just the rapid development that's occurred 
only in one less than one generation, 20 years or less. Um, it's incredible. So this is this is something we need to, you know, I mean, Andy, you've worked in the Amazon, but this is something where I think Amazon researchers really need to collaborate with the Mekong researchers and vice versa to understand these more broader global patterns that are happening. Yeah, is, is there much of a sort of global river basin cooperative approach to these issues? The Congo, of course, comes to mind and the same trends toward hydro are here and there, uh, you know, we, obviously, we, 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 you know, there's so many unique really, aspects. There's so many unique aspects of each, you know, situation. But at the same time, there are some common features. That we, we would certainly like to foster that collaboration. I mean, we work with a wonderful group of researchers in the Mekong who have been uh, very prolific in their research work. And we see, I can see, you know, just by doing lit reviews and being online and seeing the news, very similar issues and very similar research happening with what looks to be a very active group of researchers in South America focused on the Amazon. And so I think that's actually a real opportunity and a real gap, uh, very similar issues. I just read a paper yesterday about the lack of scientific data in hydropower decisions in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, that's an issue that is present in the Mekong as well, where there is rapid development of hydropower and seemingly very little input from, for example, um, fisheries researchers or university researchers uh, in terms of getting scientific input for the hydropower decisions. Yeah, I'm just the what? trying to show a paper that's relevant that Sudeep kindly shared here. I, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's happening is each of the regions of the world, whether it's the Amazon or the Congo or, or the Mekong Basin, they're all facing similar pressures. But it seems like a real opportunity for us, not only as researchers, but perhaps as managers to come together and have these global meetings that talk about yeah. how we might manage transboundary issues of water, cross-political boundaries. How, how we might optimize energy development, how we might promote biodiversity possibly in doing so. So, I mean, I think lessons learned from these different big tropical river basins can lead to win-win solutions if people are willing to, to come to the table. And that those are our big challenges next. Um, just briefly, because, you know, I, I, I'm, I love this stuff and I know, you know obviously you, you do too, it's such an important issue. Um, if you... The, the how many of the pressures are subject to some potential remedies related to global supply chains versus the deforestation being really a local growth development kind of issue? Is, is that what you're seeing around the lake? Is it more of one or the other? I don't think it's either or. I mean, I don't know, Zeb yeah. might have a different feeling, but like in the bigger basin, not around the lake, but in the in the larger lower Mekong basin, the energy demand is not only due to local change, but it's driven by economics. That energy needs to move to other parts of that region or right. they need energy in other parts of the region. And then our goods and supplies that are bought in the Western world come from that region, Western development. So, so all of a sudden we have our... My, at my home, when I buy things at, from certain companies and have them delivered to my house, and if I get them from that region, it might affect the amount of energy produced in another region that leads to the need for dams. So we need to be very conscious about kind of how we how we buy things, I think, globally, and which affects other parts of the world. Uh, Zeb, what do, you, what do you think? Is it just a local problem? or? Well, no, certainly not. Like, if, uh, you know, my a lot of my focus is on hydropower, hydropower development impact on fisheries and the hydropower. A lot of the power is coming from Laos, from dams being built in Laos. Almost all of that electricity is being exported to Thailand and Vietnam, a little bit to Cambodia, which are all growing, have rapidly growing economies and industry. And so we see the economic growth and in industry in neighboring countries driving a lot of the hydropower decisions in Laos and Cambodia with detrimental effects downstream. And so one of the big things that's happening right now is these countries are trying to make their energy supply decisions. You know, do they turn to hydropower? Do they turn to coal? Do they turn to solar? Right. Vietnam, as one example, has really turned towards solar and is developing a lot of solar capacity, but they're also... Uh, the comp it's a Vietnamese company that's planning on building one of these big mainstream dams that's going to be so environmentally damaging. So 
I mean, back to what Sadiq said, it's not, it's not an either or. I mean, everything's happening at the same time. And right. you see sustainable decisions being made at the same time you see very unsustainable decisions being made. And uh, that's one of the things that, that we struggle with. But uh, and, and Andy, could you put that map back up real quick? And yeah, so on. here in, sure. herein mm -hmm. lies the exciting opportunity. So while these are globally uh, influenced processes, there can be policies at the local level that help us maintain some of the biodiversity for future generations and some function of these rivers. So there, there's that town of Stone Trang in the upper right corner. And if you yeah. can't quite see it, but above that town are three little, three large tributaries that come into the Mekong River where those lines and dots are. Those are called the three S systems. They're, they're the names of rivers that start with the letter S. Right. One of those rivers, uh, one of those rivers happens to still be relatively undamped. So it's a large tributary yeah. that comes into the Mekong. What that means is the local opportunity is to keep one section of the river that tributary comes into the Mekong fully undamped because then at least you keep a free flowing migratory pathway and some ecological function. Right, so right, right, I'm right. saying that I'm saying this because while we might think about these as global challenges, there's some real local opportunity to prevent the full extinction of taxa. And that means keeping free flowing sections of river open and putting energy in and development and dams perhaps into other locations where there's already dams may be the way to go. Wow. That, well, that seems like a really powerful opportunity right there. Um, is there, is that at what level of government would that decision be made? So that needs to happen at the level of, of within country decision-making right in Cambodia and Cambodia uh, has had taken and has taken a progressive statement saying there would be no mainstream dams on the Mekong. There's a moratorium on, for now, until some decisions are made over this sort of half decadal plus period. Uh, and so that gives a lot of hope into, into keeping free flowing rivers. And so those decisions need to be made by our colleagues in Cambodia and reached into the Cambodian government to keep those rivers free flowing. And is there, what can people do uh, an outside world to help foster some of those decisions and going in, in a direction that you know, provides the best chance for the ecosystems along with the human systems. I mean, I'm a big fan of the power of the pen. I don't know what Zeb feels like, maybe the power of the internet, let's say. Uh, uh -huh. And so people people writing writing in to agencies there and, and echoing their voice and saying, hey, not, not just not just globally, but locally, saying we'd like to keep uh, these some of these rivers free flowing and let's think of alternative energy investments to help Cambodia. Uh, move into the future. So think about the win-win solution and not just that the world is falling apart. And is that what, any thoughts about that too from you? Well, well, I was, I mean, I'm thinking about our, our project, Wonders of the Mekong Project and what some of, you know, I was on a call with IUCN, the World Conservation Union yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, Stimson Center in DC. So there are a lot of groups that are trying to contribute, trying to, uh, you know, inform uh, help inform people uh, about these decisions. One of the things that we see, I mean, in Cambodia, we work with a you know very capable group of people who, um, you know, need to be uh, have their voices heard uh, a little bit more. So we need to raise some of the voices of some of these environmental considerations. You know, at the same time that people are making energy and development decisions. So I was on a call yesterday where. There's a dam on the Sekong, which is that northernmost tributary that Sudi pointed out, a dam on the Lao side just across the border from Cambodia will have devastating ecological consequences downstream in Cambodia. And yet there isn't very much uh, dialogue about these impacts in Cambodia. And so there not only does there need to be a dialogue in Cambodia, but then Cambodians need to take that dialogue to Laos and Vietnam. An irony here right. is the Vietnamese company that's talking about developing this dam, Vietnam is going to be uh, probably the most hurt by these decisions because the downstream country in the Delta, there was a recent paper that just came out. I don't know if you saw it in science about the Mekong Delta drowning. And within, you know, by 20, uh, right. within the next 80 years, some huge percentage of the Delta being underwater. So you know, that <laughs> there are decisions being made by 
Vietnamese companies that are going to be extremely damaging to Vietnam itself. And people, I think it's just making those connections and, and um, helping raise awareness about some of these issues. Well, if anyone uh, has connections to Angelina Jolie, we want to connect with her to be our ambassador of the makeup. Oh, okay. Well, like, you know, let me look into that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I'm just going to circle back to the Hudson one more time, just because I can't resist. Um, because there are possibilities. This, this, and it feels like you know it's not too late. I think people, there's a, there's a growing cloud of doom around a lot of in my many of my friends, especially young people these days. So, you know, I assume you guys are not feeling it's it's over. Uh, those are pretty tough dimensions of the problem you just described. But how, how do you express the possibility going forward? Could you tell us a little bit more about the Hudson? I feel like the Hudson, I'm thinking of examples of, you know, different trajectories and the Hudson, it, I, not an area I know a ton about, but was on a a very negative trajectory for a while in terms of the health of the river sure. and recently with community participation and people coming together has made kind of a, a rebound. Is that is that the case? Well, yeah, it, uh, you know, I wrote a, an extensive series about the Hudson having made this my home since the early 90s at the New York Times. And it was this transition that really, uh, when you look deeply, you know, the environmental movement came in, the Pete Seeger, my, my great, a good friend who departed us to, you know, at age 96 and the clear water and everything. Uh, and it's, sim it's kind of simple to say that happened. But a lot of that happened because of prosperity and an economic uh, industrial transition actually some of which was an in industry moving to Asia so that the banks of the river right near here, right where I am uh, again, near West Point, that there used to be my friend, John Cronin, the, the river keeper used to walk along the banks of the river in the seventies. And you could tell which factory it was by the stuff on the river. There was a tape, a cellophane tape factory, tuck tape, and the river was bank was covered with adhesive. Uh, Fishkill Creek used to run different colors based on what they're the dye of the a fabric up the river and, and on and on. And, and that moved out, you know, prosperity gave people an interest in the environment. Uh, Richard Nixon gave actually the greenest presidential speech ever in his state of the union. And I think it was 1970, you know, so that people then turned to the river instead of turning away from it. And that was the big, that's the change. And then suddenly things shift. Um, down here where I live, again, it's one of the busiest hikes in, in, in the country. Busiest day hike in the country is Breakneck Ridge. Uh, and it used to be a quarry. Uh, so so the, the things change. I'm showing a picture from the 1800s. This is in a post office. It's one of those like 1930s murals in one of the post offices further up the river of showing the, eight, this is like mid to late 1800s, the size of the sturgeon. And then they became, they were so cheap and abundant, they were called Albany beef. And, wow. and then they were just completely fished out. You know, they're, they're a, one of those species that um, uh, takes a long time to mature. And if you harvest them too young, you, you lose it. And so yeah. that, and yeah. then here, it's kind of, so then, whoops, sorry. Just want to show you the, um, again, take you back to here where you, now you have a 14 foot uh, female, uh, un undoubtedly a female out there. As you say, she's not very fat. Um, and that's just an incredible uh, sign of change. There are still enormous issues. The shad, which was the fundamental fish of the river, is gone. You know, I used to play, my band used to play at the shad festival and they'd serve shad, roasted on a plank, you know, with the, the row and that all went away. Uh, and that fish, just like you were saying, the complexities are not that it's not just a river problem. Uh, that fish was being overf overfished in its coastal migratory routes and the like. So it's, it's a systems thing. Basic development takes you toward a capacity for societies to care more about things beyond getting through the day. Industrial transitions matter. Um, they did, you know, open up some dams too here. The uh, so it's 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 a long process. I think the key is if you can catch it before those last true, you know, irreversibilities, you know, extinction, and then, then yeah. there's great hope going forward. 
Yeah, I agree with you. That's what I was going to say is showing that photo of the sturgeon. I mean, we that's mirrors what we saw on the Mekong River last week, this catch and release of a 13 foot stingray. Those mm -hmm. fish still exist in the Mekong River. And so exactly as you say, I mean, the trick is to, uh, you know, the pieces are not lost yet. We haven't seen wide scale extinction yet. And so the decisions that are being made right now, of course, um, you know, the region is going to move forward and, and develop, but yeah. the decisions being made now, trying to keep those pieces, enough of those pieces in place to keep these amazing animals around, to keep the river functioning relatively naturally so it stays productive and provides fisheries for everyone. So yeah. I think the hope is that, you know, the Hudson offers us hope because now the sturgeon are back but also provides lessons. What, how can, you know, the Mekong region move forward without losing these amazing animals that still occur in the river? We heard from our Cambodian colleagues, uh, most people in Phnom Penh in Cambodia didn't realize that the Mekong was home to the, this, these amazing fish. And yeah. so I think it was a real eye opener for a lot of Cambodians as well just to be surprised and kind of amazed that, that these animals live in, in, in the river in their backyards. That's great. And um, just briefly before we end, that's something that tipped the balance uh, for shark fins in China. I wrote about the uh, growing awareness of the, you know, the danger to sharks from that trade. And um, the folks at wild aid, I think it was like 2005, 2006, the first thing they did in testing the issue was they did surveys of public understanding and most of the population of China, at least those surveyed didn't realize that shark fin soup has shark in it. Right. And because the name of the soup in, in, in Mandarin is just a fin soup. And so that was an important step in trying to build a campaign for understanding and, and conservation. If you know, without knowing you have an impact, you're never going to care about it. So this is great. It's great work you're doing. Zeb Hogan and Sudeep Chandra from University of Nevada, Reno, far from the ocean, closer to those drying um, reservoirs where mobsters are being, are floating. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> but that's a story for another day. Uh, so thanks for being part of this uh, pop-up um, Columbia Climate School Sustain web webcast. And I'm gonna, we'll call it there, I get on with the work and I'll, this can be shared on all the platforms it's been streaming on afterwards. and. And let's check back in. There's much more to talk about here. Uh, right now, I'm writing a, yet another story on the vaquita, the little porpoise in Mexico that's on its total last legs. Well, it doesn't have legs, but that's you know really up against it. But the latest uh, signs are that there's still a slim possibility it will not die out. And uh, so stay tuned. More on that, too. Take care, both of you. Great. Welcome back. And good luck with your work. Nice speaking Take with you. Take care. Bye, Bye Andy.